Hello, my name is Harmeet Malik and I'm an evolutionary geneticist studying the molecular arms races between primates and viral genomes. I work at the Basic Sciences Division at the uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And what we hope to understand simultaneously is not just the evolutionary rules that govern these interactions between primates and viral genomes, which tells us a lot about how we evolved as well as how the viral pathogens that we interact with evolve, but we also would like to use these rules to design better therapeutic strategies to come up with sort of a better uh, antiviral intervention strategy. So in the second part of my talk today, I'm going to talk about viral evolution and how viruses might actually uh, adopt completely unexpected pathways in order to evolve in these Darwinian arms races between uh, uh, themselves as well as primate genomes. So a lot of the work on molecular arms races is actually inspired by the fictional character, the Red Queen, that was introduced to us by Lewis Carroll in his book Through the Looking Glass. And he pointed out that it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place, which was what uh, the Red Queen said to Alice. This was actually recognized as a really powerful evolutionary theorem by the uh, evolutionary geneticist Lee Van Whalen, who formalized this into the Red Queen hypothesis. And he pointed out that when two systems are basically antagonists of each other, where they're both either competing for the same resources or really taking advantage of each other in order to gain an evolutionary dominance strategy, they're going to basically be always trying to evolve to get the upper hand in this evolutionary arms race, forcing the other component to evolve. And essentially, they're just always climbing the staircase over evolutionary adaptation, effectively always staying in the same place. So there's going to be a temporary winner and a loser, which in the next cycle of adaptation gets switched around. And so this is a very typical situation as it's seen in host virus conflicts because this is exactly the type of situation where we'd expect both the viral genome and the host genome in order to be in conflict with each other, which is why we actually refer to these as the usual suspects. And so in this slide cartoon here, we have a situation where the host protein is either recognizing a viral protein such that it can actually degrade it and cleanse the organism of this infection or a viral protein actually acquiring a single amino acid mutation that allows it to evade detection by the immune system and thereby it basically gains an advantage by virtue of no longer being recognized. And so this is a situation in which either the host or the virus is always losing this arms race and therefore there's always going to be an evolutionary advantage to be gained by innovation. Now in a classical Darwinian sense, this arms race can actually be typified in a cartoon example in a population sense. So here we have again a very similar situation, an immune surveillance protein. Let's say it's an innate immune defense gene, which is actually surveying a population of viruses represented by these coat proteins. Now very much like Darwinian selection, a random mutation will arise which might actually affect one of these core proteins such that it happens to have a mutation that no longer allows it to be recognized by the immune surveillance system. This mutation could be extremely rare, happening in one in a billion viruses. Nonetheless, because all the other viruses are being recognized and cleansed out by the immune system very quickly, this virus is going to take over the population. And now the host is confronted with a virus that is actually a variant and is specifically a variant in a interaction interface, forcing the host genome to now come up with a counter evolution strategy which involves changes in the host protein. So most of the uh, positive selection or most of the evolutionary adaptation that we've been considering between hosts and viruses has really been focused on these very rapid amino acid replacements in the host virus interaction interface. But today I'm actually going to tell you about a completely novel strategy that viruses might uh, view which actually has been hidden from view from a lot of evolutionary biologists and we could actually capture that by virtue of laboratory experiments that could actually capture all stages of this adaptation process as it happened in the virus. Before I tell you about that, I need to introduce the particular system I'm going to describe. And that's an antiviral gene called protein kinase R or PKR, which is a very important innate defense system against viruses. So uh, PKR is actually expressed as an inactive a monomer, which means it's no longer active as a kinase. A kinase is a protein that actually puts phosphate moieties onto other proteins. 
On interferon uh, production, you make PKR, but you don't really mount a response. It actually takes an actual viral infection in that cell in order for PKR to dimerize using the double stranded RNA, activate itself as a kinase, and now phosphorylate its substrate EIF2 alpha or elongation initiation factor 2 alpha, whose phosphorylation will basically block protein production through the ribosome. So this is a very potent block against viruses. They can no longer go through their life cycle if no protein production is allowed to proceed. And this is a, basically, in, they have invented all kinds of strategies in order to block this PKR pathway, including preventing its dimerization, hiding away all the double standard RNA, actually reversing this phosphorylation step, as well as a completely EIF2 alpha independent form of translation initiation. Uh, we are very focused in the lab on one particular type of antagonist, which is this K3L antagonist encoded by pox viral genomes, which can essentially break the interaction interface between PKR and EIF2 alpha, and by virtue of that, essentially block the PKR pathway. Now, in part one of the seminar, I told you how PKR is actually undergoing very rapid evolution in order to gain one step ahead of K3L. What we also see is this arms race is being played out both on the host side as well as on the virus side. So if you look at K3L among different pox virus genomes, in this case we compared all the vaccinia proteins to all the smallpox proteins, we have this nice histogram of the rates of protein evolution as they happen along uh, the landscape of the genome of pox viruses. So a very simple way to look at this histogram or this bar graph is that genes on the left hand side are very slow to evolve with the protein level and genes on the right hand side are very fast evolving the protein level. And K3L happens to be one of the fastest evolving genes at the protein level in pox viral genomes, which means this very intense arms race that has played out between PKR and K3L has not only rapidly changed PKR in primate genomes, but has also changed K3L in primate genomes. So we wanted to actually capture the stages of adaptation. And so to do that, we actually turned to an experimental evolution strategy, really a very successful strategy in terms of capturing evolutionary states that might be very transient and very difficult to capture in the wild. This is a very important strategy that's been very successfully used, for instance, in bacterial evolution. So we took the vaccinia virus and we actually made one change in that virus, which is we knocked out this E3L gene, which I've not introduced you yet so far. E3L is one of those proteins that actually helps hide away the double standard RNA to prevent the PKR activation. So the reason we actually deleted E3L was we wanted to put all the selective pressure to overcome the PKR response onto the K3L gene. And we knew uh, before we started the study that the vaccinia K3L gene is actually ineffective at defeating the human PKR which is why when you delete the E3L protein, we have this dramatic drop in fitness where the wild type protein, which contains E3L, is almost a thousand fold better in infecting HeLa or human cells than is this Delta E3L uh, virus, which has been deleted for the E3L gene. So what we decided to do was simply take this virus and passage it on a plate of uh, HeLa cells. And what happens when these viruses propagate is that you basically make these uh, small plaques, which is where the virus is actually infected and burst through and, and made more progeny viruses. And we simply take all of these viruses as they emerge from a plate and transfer them to a new plate. Except in the experimental evolution strategy, we always take a historical record of this adaptation by measuring the replication rate at every step of this evolution, as well as a saving a fossil record of these viruses at every stage of their adaptation. So when we now move these to a new plates, what we would hope to see is that the virus is getting better, so we are going to see more and more plaques as this virus learns to adapt to HeLa cells. As a very important aside, vaccinia virus being passaged in chicken cells was the basis for the smallpox vaccine, which was responsible for perhaps saving more lives than any other medical intervention that we know of. And so what we did was simply passage these in HeLa cells for about 10 passages. And in just 10 passages, we, we observed something quite dramatic. So remember, the wild type uh, fitness is about here. The Delta E3L virus is about here. And what we see is that although all these viruses started off really uh, poor at infecting HeLa cells, almost all of them by 10 passages has really gained most of the fitness that they had lost in, in terms of their uh, HeLa cell infectivity. 
So we actually have multiple ways to test this. This is actually a virus titer assay in which we see what the progeny virus count looks like. But we've also replaced the E3L gene with the beta-galactosidase reporter gene and we can actually measure levels of that reporter gene as another means of actually assaying how successful the virus is. And both of these assays are very, very consistent with each other, suggesting that you started off with a very poor virus and you've actually gained most of the infectivity back in just 10 passages. And so what kind of rapid evolution might have actually happened in the course of just 10 passages for Vaccinia to have regained most of the infectivity that it lost? And so to actually address the genetic basis by how this happened, we decided to actually take the parental strain and sequence it uh, to completion, which means get very high in-depth sequence coverage to understand, okay, what is the role that perhaps rare mutations are playing in this adaptation. Then we took these three replicates at passage 10 and sequenced them such that we could compare why are these three replicates so much better than the parental strain in terms of coming up with the solution to HeLa infectivity. So when we first actually did this, so we could actually do this with very high coverage because the vaccinia genome is about 200 KB and with advances in genome sequencing technology, we could essentially get about a thousand fold coverage for every nucleotide of the vaccinia genome, which means for any mutation at the level of 1%, we can be very confident that we are not going to miss it, which is really what we wanted to understand the basis for this evolutionary adaptation. But actually, the, the first returns were very disappointing. So although we did see some really nice mutations in K3L, which I'll return to, we actually saw very low mutation across the entire genome. And that's actually consistent with the idea that vaccinia, unlike other RNA viruses like influenza or polio, is a very slowly evolved virus. So we wondered how is it that the virus, which actually didn't acquire a lot of mutations, and very few of the mutations are actually shared, none in fact are shared across all three replicates, how did it acquire this dramatic fitness gain despite actually not having been able to explore a lot of the mutational space, for instance, that a rapidly evolving RNA virus might be able to do? And so this is the sort of conundrum that really we were stuck at for a little while until uh, uh, a couple of people in the lab really recognized that we're actually only looking at some of the data by looking at each individual mutation. We have another readout when we do these kinds of genome sequences, which is we can look at how well is one part of the genome represented across the entire sequence read. So for instance, what we have here is an average genome coverage normalized to one across the entire vaccinia genome. You will see this very interesting blip right here, and this is where we've actually deleted the E3L gene. And so that's exactly what you'd expect if the E3L gene is now missing from what we are comparing to, which is the reference sequence. What really caught our eye though was this dramatic blip upwards. And when we took a closer look at these, what these are, are independent expansions of the K3L gene in every single replicate, but not in the parental strain. So you can see the parental strain shown here in blue is completely on the genomic average of one, exactly like its neighboring regions, whereas every single one of the replicates has an average K3L copy number between three or four, which is sort of a really dramatic example of how each of these three replicates has independently converged on the same evolutionary strategy, which is to amplify K3L. We were then wondering whether basically we had viruses in here that each have about three copies of K3L, and it's a pretty homogeneous population. But now that we had the fossil record, we could ask not only what the basis of this expansion was, but when it occurred over the course of evolution. And so what we discovered when we did this fossil record was we started with a parental virus that had no K3L expansions, and for about four passages, really we didn't see very much. But as we went from passage four to 10, we have this very heterogeneous virus population with this accordion-like expansion of the K3L gene, where you started with one gene, and now you have been ratcheting it upwards with every passage, increasing the average copy number. But the average copy number is actually hiding the fact that there are some viruses in here who have undergone a 10% genome expansion, which is a dramatic expansion for a virus where real estate is a really important criteria. And they're doing so 
only focused on the K3L gene because that is the evolutionary strategy they have come up with to overcome this PKR response. So another way to actually describe what we see is that we've been able to molecularly map the breakpoints. They flank this K3L gene shown here. And what we basically have is an accordion-like amplification of this original duplication now to sometimes 15 copies in these heterogeneous viruses. So this is a very dramatic and very recurrent expansion. I'm only showing you one of the three replicates we did, but the other two replicates look almost exactly identical. So the fact that this expansion is so recurrent and so dramatic led us to ask what are the consequences of this ex expansion. So we have multiple genes. Are they actually making a lot more protein than what you'd expect? And indeed, to test that, we actually took these passage 10 viruses and transfected them again back, uh, infected them into HeLa cells. And indeed, what we see is they are making a lot more K3L than even wild type uh, virus. And if you actually, uh, uh, blow up this picture, you can see that the parental E3L gene is making very little K3L compared to what is now being made by virtue of this genomic accordion expansion in these uh, replicate 10 viruses. We can now ask, okay, we now have this K3L expansion. Is this the reason why we are seeing this massive increase in fitness? And to do that, what we did was a strategy in which we can take small interfering RNAs and essentially get rid of most of the K3L uh, RNA that is being produced in these infected cells. And so when we do that, we can design RNAs and then infect vaccinia. And when we see that, what we can see is that these siRNAs are quite effective. So here's the non-siRNA uh, inhibited replicate C at passage 10. And here are a multitude of different siRNAs that basically uh, to a different degree knock down the total levels of proteins. And when we compare the fitness of these knockdown versus no knockdown or a scrambled uh, siRNA, we can see that when you knock down the K3L protein production, you essentially knock down all the gains of fitness that you've gained over the passage 10. So this K3L accordion-like expansion is both necessary and sufficient really to explain this massive increase in fitness that we saw in our laboratory. So there is, of course, the trade-off. I mean, these are viruses that actually usually prefer really compact genomes. And the trade-off is really apparent when we uh, make a comparison of these uh, passage 10 viruses in HeLa cells versus hamster cells. You can see in HeLa cells, each of the replicate viruses are doing a lot better than the parental virus. Whereas in hamster cells, these viruses are actually doing worse than the parental virus. So what's going on? It turns out that vaccinia K3L at starting point is ineffective to defeat human PKR. And it needs this massive gene expansion in order to overcome biochemically the inhibition encoded by the PKR protein. Whereas even a single copy vaccinia is able to overcome the PKR uh, inhibition encoded by hamsters. And so what we have now begun to see is if you take this ex accordion expanded virus and now in fact BHK or hamster cells, the accordion has now begun to collapse by virtue of the fact that the fitter virus is actually the smaller virus. And so this is an example where we've got this transient expansion in HeLa cells, which is now going the opposite way in hamster cells. So I'll return to those mutations that we actually first detected, which was so disappointing because they were not recurrent. But one of those mutations was especially interesting to us because it occurred in the K3L gene. It's present at about 3% frequency in replicate A and at 12% frequency in replicate C. This is a mutation in the 47th amino acid changing a histidine to an arginine. The reason this is really interesting is that because a completely independent assay many, many years earlier from Tom Dever's group had done a yeast selection experiment in which they wanted to ask, can we do a mutational experiment asking what mutation in K3L can actually overcome the inhibition encoded by PKR and allow this yeast growth to recover? If you want to learn more about this yeast growth assay, I suggest you watch part one of the seminar. What is really interesting is they come up with one mutation, H47R. We have done a completely independent experiment in vaccinia infections, and vaccinia is basically also telling us that this is the evolutionary solution that vaccinia has come up with in completely different assays, both in yeast and human. So what that means is now you started off with a K3L that was not able to defeat human PKR, and now you've acquired a single amino acid mutation in that in a Darwinian sense is able to defeat human PKR. 
But because we actually now have two forms of adaptation, this gene accordion model that we've discovered and this classical Darwinian adaptation model, we could now ask, going back to the fossil record, which occurred first and did one depend on the other? And when we basically do that by looking at when one type of mutation occurred relative to the other, what we find is that the expansion actually already happened by passage four, whereas this mutation actually only began to occur around passage five and six. Moreover, many of these H47R mutations actually occur in these already expanded accordions, which strongly suggests that after the accordion expansion, you actually increase the mutational probability of acquiring an H47R mutation, which now, by virtue of even a single copy, is able to overcome the uh, PKR response. So that actually uh, leads to a very interesting suggestion in terms of how these red qu queen conflicts might actually play out in evolution. We, we uh, think of the K3L PKR interaction as the classical Darwinian arms race. So starting off with a a step in which the vaccinia K3L is not able to defeat the human PKR. We basically acquired a sort of a transient amplification of the K3L gene, which then allowed for the selection of the H47R mutation, which was able to defeat human PKR. Now what's really interesting is now we have a single copy gene that is able to defeat human PKR. And we are very interested in asking that now that you've acquired the right mutation, will the accordion collapse? to mitigate all the fitness costs of this gene expansion. So the reason I put this cartoon up is because this cartoon should remind you a lot about this cartoon of the classical arms race, the way we think about in terms of virus antagonizing humans. But we might actually be missing this very, very important transient step, which involves gene amplification, especially in viruses and pathogens that actually don't have the high mutation rates necessary to sample the adaptive landscape. And so very much like the ability for influenza to undergo uh, chromosome reassortment to, in order to infect a new host, we think that gene amplification is one of the critical strategies that large double-stranded DNA viruses actually might be using in order to stay, uh, uh, keep pace with this sort of rapid evolution of, of the host genes that they're actually antagonizing. So with that, I'm going to acknowledge the people who did the work. All of this work was actually done by a former postdoc in the lab, Nels Eldi, who's now heads his own lab at the University of Utah, uh, in collaboration with Emily Baker and Michael Eichbusch. We do all of our pox viral work in collaboration with my senior colleague, Adam Jabal, and I especially like to acknowledge Stephanie Child uh, from his lab, who really did all of the pox viral infection experiments in collaboration with Nels. I'd like to thank Tom Dever, uh, Welkin Johnson, and Michael Emmerman for a lot of uh, reagents and help, and especially like to thank Jay Shindori and Jacob Kitzman from his lab for helping us with the analysis of these pox viral sequences. And thank you, I hope you had a good time listening to this. <laughs>